Steve is the founder of SES Incorporated, and he has over 20 years' experience in the field of materials and corrosion engineering. And he's a, he's published numerous papers and technical numerous technical papers in the professional engineering societies and review journals. He's got a bachelor's in civil engineering and a master's in materials and corrosion. So we'll just go ahead and get Steve started here. As you can see, you have seen very good presentation before me. So. In my presentation, I'm going to skip some of this, and uh, because you probably heard it already, but if you want me to stop, you can raise your hand, and we could stop and talk about it. Uh, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the extreme environment that everybody talked about. I'm going to talk about, you know, how do we analyze the structure? You know, what do you do to figure out uh, what's the condition is and things like that. So uh, there are, there are, you know problems that affect structures in different areas and the severe environment of marine corrosion is unique in that uh, it's not seen in everywhere else as you can see you know you've got the northern environment you've got uh, uh, various other environments where uh, the structure experiences corrosion in different ways from the top down but in this case it goes from the bottom and primarily it's affecting only the substructure. Sometimes if it's close enough to the water, it affects other parts of the structure as well. So you really want to understand what is the problem with the structure? And what type of structure am I dealing with? Am I dealing with a regular reinforced concrete structure? Or am I dealing with pre-stress? Or am I dealing with a combination of these two? How do you address that? All of those things you want to keep a handle on. So uh, we want to identify the problem but we also would like to get a handle on how big the problem is. We want to get to quantify the problem. So to give you an idea, you know, we take iron ore and we put a lot of energy into it and you make it steel so that we can use. What does it want to do? It wants to go right back to where it came from, right? <laughs> Unless you keep that energy up, it wants to go back to where it came from. So that's really what we're doing in all of this. We're trying to put the energy back into the system to keep it where we want it to be. Really, that's what we're doing. Um, so interruption of the cycle requires energy. And so one of the things that we, I think you've heard this a long time, and I've talked about this. Uh, what is the life of this steel from the time we put into the structure to the time we say, this is done, let's tear it down, put a new one in, right? Uh, when it's new, you don't have any problem at all. Concrete structures, when you build it for 20 years or 30 years, you know, somewhere along the line, you really don't have much of a problem right up to this point. That could be 20 to 40 years. And then it starts to have some problems, right? And you have uh, visual damage you see, and you still, what you do? You go patch, and you're done. But that patch really accelerates your problem. So you may have had maybe 40 to 50 years, you felt like the structure was really doing well with minor patch. And then from 50 to 70 years, everything seems to fall apart. What happened in the 20 year? Everybody asks you the question, hey, this thing lived for 50 years and you killed it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what? We didn't kill it. This was experiencing problem all along. We didn't just really recognize the problem that was building up. And when we actually simply patch and was increasing the problem, there comes a time you could even have a potential failure situations. And I've seen that in some places. And then we stop and say, what do we need to do now? Uh, it could be very expensive. It could be very limited in terms of the solution that you might have. However, you catch it early on in the process you may have a much better option or many options to fix the problem. So to, to really understand what to do, you have to understand what's the patient suffering from, right? And that basically requires some sort of diagnosis. So the benefit of the diagnosis, as we call benefit of inspection, is that you know the condition of the patient, who are you dealing with. In our case, it's a structure. Um, and you can address the problem before the patient is on the deathbed, right? 
now you're worried about how long is he going to live? What else am I going to do? We have to pull all the stops to get this patient to live, right? Uh, we don't want to get that because it is expensive. Um, and then you determine what kind of option do I have? Um, do I want a 10-year life? Do I want a 20-year life? Do I want a 50-year life? You really need to address that question because when I ask the you know, owners, they're not really sure. Sometimes they're very clear. I want 10 years, I'm going to replace the structure. That's great. We can work with that. And sometimes they say, well, I would like a 50, but I have, maybe we have to get two different options, 20 and a 50, because I'm not sure what my funding is. So we really want to get that in up first to figure out what's the life they want. Then you can start working towards what are the options we have. And then look at the cost. I mean, everything at the end of the day depends on what it's going to cost. So that's the reason why you really want to have the inspection to get quantify the problem. Because if you have a bridge that's a mile long, 50 spans, and you've got deterioration at various levels, you can't use one system. <coughs> or you may not use that one system for the entire bridge. You may go piece by piece, depending on how difficult it is. Working on a sound mile bridge, you can't do everything all at once. Even though that's what is needed, you just don't have the money, right? So um, here, what we're going to talk about is how do you do the survey? What are the particular ingredients you need to evaluate? Um, so there are some, some of the things we did here. Um, we want to know what damages there are, spall and delamination. Ivan was talking about in structures, substructures, sometimes you see only crack. And you think it's just the crack that happened when you drove the pile down. Maybe it's so, maybe it's not. Even if the crack happened because you, you know, driven the pile down, that is a deterioration that occurred from the beginning and is exposed to the seawater, and that can seriously affect the service life of that pile. So you really want to look at, you know, delamination and spall, along with also cracks and the cracks that bleed. Rust is an obvious problem, child, you know? So you want to look at those. And then the potential, you know? Corrosion potential is really critical. It helps you understand. Now, keep in mind, potential has a limitation. When you get close to the water, the potential may not be a good reflection of what's going on in the structure. It could always be active, right? So you want to look at all those things. You definitely want to know the concrete cover. How much cover do you have? The higher the cover sometimes, it's harder to figure out whether it's a delamination, whether it's simply a crack, uh, unless you go there and actually test it. Um, some of the NDT tools that we have may not really truly reflect that. We've used them, infrared camera. Now, three inches and beyond, it's a little bit difficult, particularly if the structure is sitting in the water, water is acting as a heat sink, right? And chloride sampling is absolutely essential. You have to get an idea how much of chloride you have, how deep it is, <laughs> And that will tell you what are your options as well. And the continuity is essential. Why do we need continuity? Well, if you're going to do any mitigation to address the corrosion issue, you want to make sure your steel is in one piece. If you put a steel piece over here, over here, over here, they're all discontinuous. You try to apply current. That current is not going to go to everything. It goes to only those pieces of steel that are connected to your anode. So you have to think about it. whichever piece of steel that's connected to the anode are the ones that's going to receive current. Now, the other ones that are not connected not only may not receive current, it may actually corrode. So that's the reason you want to know that and you want to fix that. So in this case, we have not only the piles. Uh, in, this, in this particular presentation, I'm going to talk about only the piles. We actually address the pier caps and the piles as well. It's interesting that the whole uh, structure is a wharf, meaning it's a marine structure that supports loading and unloading of submarine. And it's a mission critical structure, meaning if you ask the captain, if I don't have the structure, I can't execute and protect this country. That's how he talks. And I'm thinking, my gosh, you know, if you come here and do this, I don't want to see you for the next 25 years. 
because this is going to work day and night. You know, it, we can't stop working. And so we wanted to know. Underneath, when we look at the evaluation of these pile caps in the piles, and then identify what are the repair options you have for the 25-year life they want, and what, are, what is it going to be the cost, and how do we fund this thing, right? Problems with retrofit. Well, salt water, obviously. You know, we all know it's a very corrosive medium. And this has led to significant damage on the pier cap, which is regular reinforced concrete, and on the piles, there are damages that are visible. We'll talk about that, exactly what they are. Um, two-thirds of the caps, almost, two-thirds of the cap. That means it's a significant problem going on. Why is that? The cap is having more problems than the pile. Um, the cap is very close to the water, and the cap is a different concrete than the pile. So you, all, you know, when you're doing all these evaluation, if there is, you know, this is obviously a flip you would expect more damage on the piles than the pile cap, because the pile cap is above the water, well above the water. Uh, so when, in that case, the first question you ask is, what kind of cover do I have? What kind of concrete do I have? That will answer your question. Uh, almost 8% of the pile exhibit problems, right? Loss of seal, loss of cross-section, loss of concrete, loss of load capacity. Is and then the question becomes, hey, am I in a danger of losing my wharf, or this can be preserved? That's another question Ivan was talking about, right? Corrosion, when we address corrosion, we're addressing anything that could possibly happen in the future in terms of the loss of steel. But what is already, what we've already lost, we can simply bring it back with CP. We need to address what we already lost with some kind of structural evaluation and address those before you go with that. Um, we talked about this. These are number of infe inspections we performed, potential resistivity, chloride analysis, and uh, of course, visuals and to identify what kind of damage you have. Here are some of the examples of the damage we've seen on the cap as well as the column. I'm going to run through it pretty quickly. As you can see here, there's a whole lot of uh, you know, when you have all these uh, marine growth, how do you identify what's the damage under these marine growth? That's a difficult one, uh, but it does occur a lot. And right up the top cap, you can see, uh, all you can see, it looks like a crack. But when you tap it, you can see the delamination, you can hear it. Uh, sometimes it's hard to hear, but mostly you can hear it. Here's some of the damages you see when I actually remove that concrete. And then you also measure the section loss. The, the steel that you see there looks like it's there, but when you remove and clean it up, you could see a section loss as much as 50%. And sometimes I see even more than that. So just because you see that doesn't mean that all the steel is there. When you clean it and measure it, that could be a very different story. And if you look at the piles, um, they only have a crack. When you remove a little bit of the concrete and you see, hey, you got some corrosion. When you clean this and actually measure the section loss, you have a good 10 to 15% section loss on this. When pre-stressing strand have 10 to 15% section loss, you, you need to pay attention. You know, you can't let it go any further um, because you are stressing at a much higher level than the regular steel. So we've uh, uh, visually inspected um, all of the piles. There are hundreds of piles in here, and 30 of them exhibited cracking. Uh, most of these cracks had rust stains as well. Now remember, some of these cracks may not have rust stain. Doesn't mean the corrosion is not going on. You just have to go and look at them. Um, sometimes it may not be, but that's good. But anytime you have a crack that's gone to the st strand, you're going to see some, some form of corrosion. Um, you can see uh, 32, three of the 22 inspected pile exhibited significant concrete damage. Now, you think about it, hundreds of pile, only three of them exhibiting, out of the 22 exhibiting significant damage? Uh, it's about 8%, right? Um, but we looked at them. There are others 
that have corrosion problem that hasn't exhibited concrete damage. So you kind of keep that in mind that just because you don't have concrete damage doesn't mean the corrosion hasn't started and acting on your structure. Electrical discontinuity. And now one other thing I ask, you know, why do I need to measure the continuity? Is it absolutely essential, particularly on a structure where you got to go in a boat and work on it? It takes some time. Well, most of the time I see you might have discontinuity in the piles, specifically. And you d definitely want to measure. And at this point, we even write in the specification the contractor will have to make all steel continuous and give specification in terms of how to make it continuous just so we know we've done enough of this work to know that it's going to happen anyway. And uh, these are some of the discontinuity piles that we looked at. And we also looked at some of them do not have corrosion because we actually opened up some sections where there were no damage at all. So you can see um, the potentials themselves indicate that it's very active and the corrosion is going on. Um, there are standards that tells you if you have more than, you know, more negative than 350 millivolts that you got corrosion. And this, so what you're doing in cathodic protection is making sure that you are pushing the current back in uh, to prevent this corrosion that goes on. So what did we do? There are a total of 396 piles. And we measured, you know, we visually evaluated every single one of them. Uh, 30 piles with cracking, three piles with significant damage. Your concrete cover, you have sufficient cover based on the design cover that you have for all of the reinforcement. Continuity, you do have discontinuity in the structure. Corrosion potential, you do have active corrosion that's going on in the structure, 36%. That's a good percentage in the structure. So here are some of the you know, evaluation data that we collected and presented to the client to indicate what kind of cover you have, what kind of potentials you have, where, where is this active. As you can see, typically it's active towards the water and not towards the, the cap level on the pile itself. And you can see this is a typical uh, chloride. Um, is, as you can see here, the threshold is way down below. Most of the chlorides is well above the threshold. Particularly at the steel level, you see significantly higher than the threshold. And this has been the case in almost all of the uh, sample that we collected. Though, so you know, even though if you don't, if you don't see damage, does not necessarily mean you're OK, because the chlorides are still there. You really need to address the problem. Um, except the cap is showing damage piles is starting to show damage. Uh, summary, um, we know, we, I just talked about it, salt is diffused in, corrosion has started, damage is occurring. We really need to figure out how many piles we need to do what, how many pier caps we need to do what. And that's really what we summarized in our report. These are the piles that we need to address and all of the caps need to be addressed. There are different solutions that we recommended, particularly for this structure, because regular reinforced pier cap had significant uh, reinforcement. So uh, to provide galvanic protection for that, it's very difficult. So we, we suggested impressed garden for the caps. And we suggested also impressed garden for the um, and galvanic for your piles. Cathodic protection, we talked about that, so I'm going to skip that. What is cathodic protection? You have an anode. You have the rebar or the strand as a cathode in your concrete. Your concrete is the electrolyte. And your electrical connection, the wire that you put between the two. Four components, that becomes your cathodic protection system. And uh, if you pass enough current from the anode to the steel, and the steel polarizes enough, you get protection. And how you measure the actual protection itself, if you get 150 millivolt of depolarization, then you fully protect the structure. So that's really critical. Whether you do a galvanic system, whether you do an impressed current system, you have to measure the level of protection that you achieve. Uh, Ivan talked about it. You, know, you have to monitor. Are you getting the full protection you need? Are you getting partial protection? So uh, the design is primarily to make sure that you are trying to 
design system to get full protection on the structure, right? And so this is the typical, you know, well, rebar and anode, and you connect the two, and you pass the current between the two anode. From the anode, through the concrete, to the steel, is how the current flow should be to protect your steel, right? And the galvanic is very similar, except that you don't have a power supply, right? Um, and when you finish it, that's typically what it's going to look like when you put the jacket, when you uh, have an anode inside the jacket. Now, there are a lot of the owners that do simply jacket without the galvanic or uh, impressed current CP. Um, sometimes it's work, sometimes it is not. The question is, well, when do you use a regular jacket? When do you use a CP jacket, right? In a severe environment like this, as Ivan said, we all know at this point using a regular jacket is not a very good idea. It's not going to last very long. And two, the corrosion is going to continue. When you remove them, you would have lost all of your steel. Then it becomes a, uh, an issue of how to even repair that structure, right? Um, you have to stage that repair. So press current, the advantages and disadvantages, it's all there. I'm going to skip some of these things. Of course, we recommended that any jacket, any pile with less than 5%, you can use the galvanic jacket. More than 5% damage you have, you should be thinking about impressed current jackets. And uh, piles with greater than 10% damage definitely go for the CP impressed current jacket. Now I've got exam advantages and disadvantages. I'm going to skip because everybody else talked about it. Um, we, we also calculated the cost. If you do only simply patch repair, what, are you gonna, what is it going to cost? If you simply do a patch repair with the regular jacket, what is it going to cost? As you can see at the bottom, um, and we also looked at the life of all of these. Um, so we look at the cost here. There. When you look at the cost here, if you simply put a patch, um, as Ivan said, the patch is not effective at all. It continues to deteriorate the structure right around the patch. So you have to go back almost every two years to address this problem, which becomes pretty expensive. As you can see in this case, it, it was the most expensive option there is. And what became clear in this exercise is that your galvanic and impressed current are options that are cheaper in terms of initial costs as well as your uh, well, you know, initial cost may be different, but the life cycle cost, those two are your options really comes out as a best option for the structure. Now, we had to do a combination of impressed current in certain areas and galvanic in other areas, so we came up with the total cost a little bit different from this, but, they, but the combination becomes the cheapest option for this particular structure. So you really want to look at, when particular structure is big, you want to look at what your options are and use it judiciously, what is going to work. So always think about that. It's a, it's a money well spent early on thinking through the process instead of trying to figure it out later. So that closes my presentation. <laughs>